Hey Vinyl Community, I'm Robert Fithin, and a couple months ago I put up a video on YouTube, the most valuable albums I have according to Discogs, and that's what it was. It was 10 albums that were uh, the most valuable ones I had according to what people had paid the median price on Discogs, and the video blew up. Uh, th first of all, uh, welcome to all the new subscribers that found that video and subscribed to me because of that, but in the comments there were a lot of comments that said, why don't you make a video of the most valuable albums according to what you think are valuable or what holds a, a place in your heart, what you treasure as a valuable item and not so much what they're worth or whatever. So that's exactly what this is, my most valuable albums according to me. Now, a warning, here's where it gets real dorky because we're talking nostalgia here, things that are close to my heart. These albums aren't really worth anything. They're not collectible or anything like that. These are just albums that I personally treasure. And we start off with the Beatles. Uh, as a little kid listening to a lot of music, in oldies especially, uh, I never heard a lot of Beatles because I listened to oldies on like oldies compilations and 45s and things like that. And the Beatles were never on those. They were never on hits of super hits of the 60s or whatever. In order to have Beatles music, you had to have Beatles records. And so this was given to me as a gift in um, when I was eight years old, uh, Easter of 1981. And this is a, a capital compilation of Beatles songs. Um, and I think the reason that I got this as a gift as opposed to like Meet the Beatles or Sgt. Pepper or something like that is because it was $4.95 at Kmart. All the other Beatles albums are $8, so they got me this for Easter. And uh, wow, what an introduction to the Beatles. It's got a lot of great songs in here, a lot of cover songs actually uh, for this. This is Rock and Roll Music Volume 1. Uh, it was originally released by Capitol as a two-album set uh, that looked like this back in 1976 and it kind of looks like a 50s thing with the 50s cars and the hamburgers and coca-cola and poodle skirts and i don't know i don't really understand the uh concept behind the cover art but uh, this was originally a two album set and what i got uh was just volume one which starts off with twist and shout uh, a lot of cover songs on here but these are rock and roll songs there's no ballads on here so great for an eight-year-old uh, with their first Beatles album. I also found out later on these are actually remastered by George Martin himself back in 1976. Uh, this is the 1980 pressing and um, they sound great. There's versions of like You Can't Do That, I Call Your Name, uh, Long, Tong, Long uh, Tall Sally that sound so much better than they do on like the Beatles second album or whatever. Uh, strangely enough the channels are reversed on this. What would have been on coming out of your right speaker uh, now it comes out of your left speaker and vice versa. And as a kid, I used to love to, you know, do the thing with the Beatles where you could turn off the vocals by turning on the left speaker and all that stuff. So still love this. Any guesses as to what my second Beatles album that I ever got was? Yeah, uh, you guessed it right. Rock and Roll Music, Volume 2. It's kind of similar to the 1966, uh, you know, the Red and Blue uh, albums. As a, It's sort of chronological, not exactly, but kind of semi-chronological so volume two has a lot of the later like rock songs like dizzy miss lizzie uh i'm down is on here back in the ussr helter skelter is on here my mom almost didn't buy this because helter skelter is on here um hey bulldog birthday they're all on here and like i said remastered in 76 by george martin himself and they sound terrific uh again i get it it's just a beetle it's just a capital cash grab basically re-released uh this version in 1980 um but yeah for 4.95 a piece a capital value uh that's that's why i ended up with uh these two the third beatles album i ever got was another capital compilation called real music this was um, a compilation of music uh, from their movies and the reason i got this is because it was on sale at target for 5.99 and again all their other albums are eight dollars this was considered a new release at the time and this came out in 1982, and the thing that I loved about this, I mean, I, I'm getting a new Beatles album, I love that. But when I open it up, it's got this booklet in it uh, with all of these movie scenes and movie posters. Again, this is 1982, so this is before the internet when you can just see all this whenever. I mean, to have a booklet like this was incredible, but even better than that was the inner sleeve, which was like all of the Beatles albums. And when I saw this, I knew that I had to get every single one of these. It became a goal. These are, of course, the U.S. Uh, Capitol albums. And the very first one that I got was Magical Mystery Tour. Again, these are all 
uh, very valuable to me and hold a place in my heart because again, I, th these are a lot of my Beatles albums I got new. And I'm the only owner, you know, ever since I was nine years old. I, I'm the only one, you know, they were bought new at Kmart. And yeah, they're the Purple Capital 1978 uh, pressings, which, again, aren't really worth much to collectors. But these were my Beatles albums that I grew up with as a child. My Magical Mystery Tour, even. Doesn't even have the booklet with it. It's got the purple thing here where it normally advertises the 24-page book. It's Purple Capital. It's not worth a lot, but means a lot to me, especially... Since this one has an off-center label, label's a little bit off-center, just a little bit. I don't know if there's another one like that that exists in the world. But yeah, my Magical Mystery Tour. So all my Beatles albums, uh, most of them um, are the are the Purple Capital. I bought them new or got them as a gift new from Kmart or whatever. And uh, they mean a lot to me. If I was to lose you know, this or whatever, or get blown away in a tornado... That would suck because, uh, yeah, like I said, this, I mean, I have other copies of this. I have the old original Capital now with the booklet and all that. And I have a British version and all. I have multiple versions of different Beatles albums. But the ones that I had when I was a kid that I got brand new uh, hold the most, uh, most valuable to me in my heart. And from the Beatles, we move on to Kiss. I was actually into Kiss before I was into the Beatles. I'm a, I'm a seven or eight year old when I get this. Double Platinum. It was the first Kiss album I ever had. I don't remember how I discovered Kiss because I didn't listen to the radio. I didn't, uh, you know, it was all, I loved listening to records and tapes and, th and things like that and people's collection, my brothers and sisters and whatever. I don't remember, maybe I saw them on TV or something like that. I don't remember. It was before Kiss Meets the Phantom. I remember that. Uh, but this is 1978. Got this for Christmas. I actually have a Super 8 home movie of me opening this. And with the little, uh, it's still got the uh, the uh, order form in here. Th th this was dreaming right here, trying to, you know, yeah, 20 bucks for a shirt. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, so that never got sent off. And then the, uh, the little uh, award is in here somewhere too. But yeah, Kiss Double Platinum. And then just like the Beatles, uh, before with Kiss, you know, got the Double Platinum uh, with all the songs from all the, and then had to get all, all the various Kiss albums. And... Uh, scored at a garage sale um my mom stumbled on a garage sale that had like six kiss albums and i only had this one at the time so that was like wow gold mine um i don't know what the story with that was i'm assuming some poor kid his mom made him get rid of all of his kiss records because they were satanic or something but uh, all those kiss records they were used but they still hold a place in my heart but this one was one that was bought for me new uh, for Christmas, so I'm I'm the only owner of this since 1978. Another fun fact: uh, the uh, Kiss album that I had, uh, the first one, which is my favorite Kiss album, their debut. The one I had didn't have a Kiss in Time on it. Now, with everything I've learned since then, obviously I realize now that the reason it doesn't is because this is a first pressing. And uh, the first pressings didn't have that song, but I had no idea when I was a little kid. I thought that all the Kiss albums. Just had four songs on side two. I never even heard about Kiss in Time or heard it or anything until much, much later. And then when I finally did, it was like, wow, I'm actually kind of glad I didn't have that on an album. That song is terrible. But yeah, uh, Kiss without Kiss in Time. Uh, this one might actually be a little bit valuable, but um, still, it, it's my Kiss album I had since I was, you know, eight years old. So means a lot to me. But the double platinum especially, because that one was uh, brand new and I'm the only owner of this ever. Going back even further in time to when I was four or five years old with my little close and play um, record player, here's my little box of 45s. Um, I used to play these over and over again. A lot of oldies in here, a lot of country. Oh, there's Afternoon Delight <laughs> from the Starland Vocal Band. Again, not worth a lot, but all of these are uh, very special to me. I remember the first time uh, you know, 45s is what we could afford. You know, I would get those new sometimes in the store or from garage sales or whatever, my little denim uh, record carrying case there. But um, my little clothes and play player when I was like four years old. And uh, I remember the first time, I think I was four or five, I ever went into a legitimate record store. It was in the mall, and I want to say it was Record Bar um, in St. Clair Square uh, in Fairview Heights, Illinois probably five, four or five years old, I remember this deep, deep blue carpet and just this treasure trove of records and tapes everywhere. I was blown away. 
And I remember seeing this one guy walking around with like eight albums brand new that he was going to buy and walking around looking for more. And I'm like, one day I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that goes into a record store and buys like eight brand new albums like it's nothing. Because when I was growing up, I was really the only one in my family that was really into records and music and stuff like that. So it was looked upon as more of like a, a kid's thing. Like that was my toys, you know, was was records and whatever. So to see grown adults in a record store... Uh, buying records that was mind blowing to me. I loved it, and I, you know, some kids want to grow up to be firefighters or policemen or doctors, and I want to grow up to be that guy with eight records in his hand in the, in the record store. So uh, yeah, bring it, look at those forty fives brings back that memory. Record bar. I, I'm pretty sure that's the one it was, but yeah, I, I knew I was I was blown away when I saw that record store. Uh, but going back to the records that uh, have a place near in my heart, there aren't a lot of real eighties stuff in here. Because when the 80s happened, especially the mid-80s, I switched over to cassettes and then on to CDs. So things that I discovered in the 80s, like my Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction or Purple Rain or, you know, Van Halen stuff and all that, that was all on cassettes. So, uh, and I eventually traded all those in to get CDs and whatever, so I don't have those anymore. So I don't really have a lot. I mean, I have Van Halen albums and I have, you know, Guns N' Roses, whatever, but they're, th those particular records aren't you know, treasured by me because they were bought later or whatever. The original way that I listened to those was on uh, cassettes, like I said, and CDs, and the cassettes are, are long gone now. But there was one album, a record from the 80s that I did get because I won it from a radio station. Pat Benatar, Seven the Hard Way. Now, again, I'm reiterating here. I'm not talking about most valuable albums, most collectible albums, best-sounding albums, Albums with the best music on them, albums I listen to all the time. That's not what this video is. This video is strictly albums that are personal to me because of a specific reason. And Pat Benatar, I won from KWK radio station when I was, I want to say 12 or 13. Um, I remember going to St. Louis for one of the first times, riding a bi-state bus for the first time with my sister, who was older, who went to St. Louis University. And she was acting like she knew her way around. She didn't. The bus let us off on the complete wrong end of the street. We had to walk blocks and blocks and blocks. Basically, we wanted the South Hampton or something, and then we got let off on Hampton. Had to walk for, I mean, it was a good hour. Just walking, walking. We're trying to find this radio station. And finally got it and uh, picked up my Pat Benatar 7 Hardway album. This was the, uh, I think, I want to say this is only one of, one of two things I ever won from a radio station. But this is the one with uh, Invincible on it, La Bellage, and uh, Sex is a Weapon. So, Seven the Hard Way from Pat Benatar. A treasure, not the best album in the world, but it means something to me just because I remember my first bi-state bus and walking all over St. Louis to the radio station. And my first album that ever had like a promotional stamp on it. So, Pat Benatar, Seven the Hard Way. Well, it's special to me, anyway. Speaking of radio stations, this one is really special. This is by a band called Pink Floyd, and this is their album called The Wall. Now, I'm sure you probably know that, but this actual record, pressing whatever you want to call it, this actual record, is uh, very special to me. I have a kind of a history with this album, and I'll take this time to uh, share this history with you. Uh, when I was a little kid, and it was, I think, 1979 or 1980 is when uh, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, the single came out from Pink Floyd, and I wanted that song. Again, I don't remember where I first heard about that song. Uh, maybe it was just because of the We Don't Need No Education and Teacher Leave Them Kids Alone. Maybe kids were singing it in school, and I thought it was cool or whatever. I don't remember where I heard the song, but I knew that I wanted that song, and... I uh, went to, uh, you know, I, I got it, I think my mom got it for me, at Kmart or whatever, my brother was saying, don't get in that, that's got dirty words on it. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Uh, so maybe he was talking about the album or whatever, but I got the 45 um, for Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. A few years later when I was in high school, well, first of all, when I was at the store, I would always see the, this album and it was so intriguing to me because it was just a wall. And I knew that it had that song in there, and I was wondering what my brother was talking about, like dirty words and all this stuff. When you used to see double albums in stores, um, and this went along with the White Album and uh, the you know all, all, any kind of double album, it was always sealed, so you never knew what was lurking inside there on the inside, you know, because it was always sealed. And albums like this, or the White Album, or whatever, where it's just nothing but this, it was such. So intriguing. It was such a mystery. Like, wow. And I knew I was never going to get this. 
because it was $14. This was back in 1980. This was $14 new at Kmart. So there's no way I'm getting this album. So I got the 45. Now, years later, um, this uh, station in town, this radio station called Keishi, used to, or they still do, play albums all the way through every Sunday night. And they played The Wall when I was, uh, I believe, a sophomore in high school. And so it was great to hear that album all the way through. I recorded it. I used to listen to that tape over and over and over. Side 4, for uh, some reason, didn't record or was messed up, so I never really got to hear Side 4 a lot. But I would hear that tape over and over and over. And for Christmas, I actually got the legitimate Pink Floyd The Wall cassette. Would listen to that over and over again. And it all started when I you know, recorded the, the album off of Keishi, the radio station, that they played on Sunday nights. And then I get the cassette that Christmas. And then when I got my first CD player, one of the first CDs I got was the master recording, the Mobile Sound uh, Fidelity, uh, or Mobile Fidelity, Mobile Fidelity Sound? Mobile Sound Fidelity. I never can't remember which order it goes in. Anyway, this is the really expensive two disc uh, original master recording version of this. And this was uh, what I had, and uh, it sounds a little bassy, actually. It sounds like, you know, the drums just thud, thud. It's kind of overpowering. But this was the uh, one that I had for a while. I got this, like I said, when I was uh, uh, got my first CD player. I was probably a senior in high school, maybe just out of high school or something like that. Got the uh, remastered one later when they went all over to uh, Columbia, or Capitol, when they went from Columbia to Capitol, and then all their stuff was on Capitol. Got the remastered one, but this is the one that is most dear to my heart because what happened is I started working in radio. Uh, I've been in working in radio for 25 years. The station that played those songs, uh, played those albums on Sunday night, uh, our company bought them and they moved into our building. So now I work with that radio station and they got rid of all of their record albums recently including this one. What they did was, these are record albums that they had uh, that they only played a few times because they were replaced by CDs. So this was legitimately the actual record that was playing on their radio station when I recorded it onto a cassette way back when I was, you know, whatever, junior high or whatever. So that, I thought that was pretty cool. So I'll always treasure this because this was the actual album that the radio station played on Sunday night all the way through. This is the copy that I recorded on a cassette and now all these years later I actually have it. So pretty cool uh, Pink Floyd the Wall that I'll always treasure and I just got that just uh, last year so uh, I'm glad to really have that. That's pretty cool that I was able to actually get the actual record that the radio station played that uh, I recorded on a cassette all those years ago. Okay, and to wrap this up, I, th I talked earlier about how I discovered music when I was a little kid by just listening to people's records and 8-tracks and things like that, and that's how I discovered a lot of the oldies stuff, and these were actually the first two albums I ever heard. Uh, I heard these on 8-track, so I don't have the 8-tracks anymore, but I do have these albums. These particular ones aren't really that special to me, but the actual the, the releases are. Uh, again, first heard these on 8-tracks. The first one is this disc, Dick Clark's 20 Years of uh, Rock and Roll. It's in chronological order. I think the 8-track pretty much was as well. Uh, but this is a two-disc thing, and this is a great overview of the early years of rock and roll. It starts off in 1955, goes all the way to 1972, and it's things like the, the Rock Around the Clock and Carl Perkins' Blue Suede Shoes. And I'm walking from Pat, Fats Domino and Jerry Lee Lewis, a whole lot of shaking going on. And the Shirelle Soldier Boy, Peppermint Twist is on here. Louie Louie from the Kingsmen's on here. Wooly Bully's on here. You've Lost That Love and Feelings on here. Brown Eyed Girl uh, sitting on the dock of the bay. Superfly is on here. So, I mean, this is it. I mean, this is a great introduction. And this was the very first album I ever heard. And I, you know, I knew who Dick Clark was from American Bandstand, so I thought he had something to do with all these people. But really, it's just his face on there and, and whatever. And then this is the other one, the number one hits of the 60s. This was a two-tape uh, set. I think it's four, four records. But it's basically a lot of the songs that went to number one in the 60s. Obviously, no Beatles on here, no Elvis on here. But you do get Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow and Leader of the Pack and Sugar Sugar and Venus and uh, Chapel of Love, Pony Time, I'm a Believer from the Monkeys, Surf City is on here and uh, 
House of the Rising Sun, Everybody's a Star, 96 Tears, Hanky Panky, Groovin', uh, Over and Over from the Dave Clark Five, Hang On Sloopy, Happy Together, Kind of a Drag, Green Tambourine. That was probably my, one of my favorite songs as a kid, but they're all on here as well. So uh, I love hearing these songs like, you know, in the order that they used to be uh, on. So um, same thing with those Beatles of rock and roll music. I still love hearing those Beatles songs in the order they were on that compilation. So... These are my most treasured albums, according to me, not according to any discogs or any prices or anything like that. Like I said, there's not a lot from the uh, 80s or 90s, because basically then I was buying a lot of CDs and, and before that cassettes. Uh, and so really my, my most treasure stuff uh, is stuff from my childhood, basically. And that's what a lot of this is. So thanks for watching. Uh, I'm Robert Fitton. Hopefully I'll have some more videos for you coming soon. Once again, welcome to all the new subscribers. And what albums are you most uh, treasuring? Uh, you have albums, specific ones that you just couldn't let go of, or you'd be really sad if for some reason they were lost or damaged or something. Again, doesn't matter how much they're worth, how collectible they are to somebody else. What albums do you treasure in your collection? Let me know in the comments. And once again, thanks for watching.